What's up gamers, welcome to Tears of the Kingdom. I'm gonna be showing you a bunch of amazing early game tips that'll make your playthrough almost flawless so that you can unlock a lot of things and know about a lot of the mechanics at the start of the game. Let's get started. As soon as you complete Tutorial Island, head over to the lookout landing as soon as possible and talk to Pura. She'll send you over to the castle to talk to someone. It will send you back to her and at that point, Skyview Towers will be visible, which will be what reveals the map and she will hand you the paraglider, allowing you to explore more locations in the game. Trust me, the Paraglider will make everything easier, so get that before exploring. You can actually open up your Pura pad in the sky and you are skydiving down or paragliding and you can look around for objects of interest for you. I aimed at watchtowers and marked them with the little bulb because those look like towers and I looked for any shrines when I dropped to a lower altitude where clouds were in my face that were the green glowing things on the ground. You literally cannot miss these things when you are looking around. They're right there. So I marked those with a star. Choose a good marking system for whatever you do because it'll make your life easy and it won't get confusing because these maps can get really bad if you don't know exactly what you're writing or what you're posting. Pressing minus will bring up your mini map and all information within the game. Pressing plus will bring you to all your items, your armor, your arrows, shields, swords, materials, all cooked foods, zone devices, key items that you can't really touch and use, and your system settings. When you open up your system settings, go to options and scroll all the way down to HUD mode. When you select pro and HUD mode, it'll clear everything off of your screen. So you can do this if you wanna play the game in a more challenging way and figure out everything, or if you just want to turn on this mode to get rid of the HUD so you can take some really nice screenshots to share with everyone online. Or just to document the cool items you found in the beginning of the game by watching a Philly Beats You video. When you get to a shrine that's new, make sure to go ahead and just touch it once. Because when you just bump into it, you can't really teleport to it at all. But once you tap it, you'll be able to officially teleport to that shrine. When you complete a shrine, it'll be in blue on the map. And when you touch a shrine and activate it as a teleport point, but don't complete it, it'll have an orange and blue color. Until you complete a shrine, they will always have the green swirly thing on top. Every light route in the depths has a corresponding shrine in Hyrule right above it. And the cool part is if you look above and below, the names are actually reversed on the shrines. So if you're looking to find some shrines above, you can find a light route below and mark them above. And if you're looking for some light routes below, you can find a shrine you found above and mark it there so you can find it down below. It's pretty cool. Cool. There are a total of 15 Skyview Towers in the game. Luckily, you already unlocked one right in Lookout Landing, so that leaves just 14 on your map that you have to do. Unlocking all of these will reveal the entire overworld map and the Sky Islands above. When you open up your map, you have pins in the game. Now, these pins act very differently depending on when you place them. If I place one here on the Sky Island, I can go down and I also see the pin down below on the surface level, also down in the depths of Hyrule. But you notice that the pin is going to be fully square with a glowing top only at the location you placed it. If I go ahead and I place another pin over here on the mainland and I go up, only the pink pin is going to be glowing because that one was pinned on top, while the blue one is only going to be glowing because I placed it on the surface. And the same applies for if I place one down in the depths. So whatever one is glowing is the active location on your map for that level of land. So the depths, the mainland, or the sky islands. Those are going to be how you identify your pins. Then you can convert your pins into stamps, which will not show up on the other parts of the map. So that's how you're going to be able to use your pins and stamps. The next one is very big, so please pay attention. After you launch from Skyview Tower and talk to Pura, Joshua will run down to Robbie and you'll talk to them to initiate a quest that takes you to the depths. And if you follow that quest line, you'll eventually will unlock the camera feature. Once this is done, Robbie will not progress to do anything else. In order to have Robbie progress to the next quest, you must unlock auto build and must complete one dungeon, which is one of the four locations on the map that Pura tells you. It doesn't matter which one you do. You then will be able to auto build his balloon and the next quest line will unlock that gives you access to the sensor plus that allows you to take any picture of an object and track it, hero's path mode that reaches traces the steps you took in the game, and three travel medallions that act as instant fast travel locations that you can place anywhere. When you complete your first dungeon, the horn statue should be unlocked in the shelter in Lookout Landing. 
You'll see this by a lady standing, staring at a hole down there saying, I think I hear something. It'll take a heart piece of stamina from you and give you 100 rupees for it. But if you want it back, you have to pay 120 rupees. But you can decide if you want to change all your hearts into stamina or all your stamina into hearts or just balance it out. You can unlock auto build by going to the abandoned central mine located in the Great Plateau. Here's a bonus tip. You should hit that subscribe button so that Link can beat all these enemies and get to Ganondorf. Also, we'll make more amazing videos like this as you subscribe. So please hit that button. We're gonna go ahead and just cut the grass and then we should get a secret reveal a restless cricket Now we're gonna be collecting about nine of these restless crickets here So we're gonna need three to make an elixir of something. So we're gonna collect nine So I'm just gonna go ahead chop up the grass Okay that's nine crickets. Now, the next thing we're gonna need are some bokoblin horns. We're gonna go ahead and we just need three bokoblin horns. So let's run over to this camp real fast. That is not a great place to shield surf. <laughs> There's another bokoblin horn. And there is another one. Okay, bokoblin horns all done. Okay, now we're gonna head back to Lookout Landing. Once you are back in Lookout Landing, make sure to quickly head down here to this underground shelter over here. And if you haven't opened this up, just talk to this guy and it shall open up for you. Now, when you head down here, you're gonna find the cooking pot, which is right over here with the guy sitting down by the cooking pot. That's, that's exactly where it is. Open up your plus and then what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be grabbing ourselves one of these and three crickets. One, two, three and then you're gonna cook it. Press X to skip so we can go a little bit faster. If you are ever feeling stuck somewhere and can't figure out what to do, use Ascend. Start making it a habit to use Ascend to get out of any cave. Use Ascend in combat, just use it everywhere. So something that every player should be aware of is combining both Ultra Hand and Recall together to make something really cool in a combination. If I was to, example, pick this up with my Ultra Hand, and drag it all the way over here and then drop it. Well, then if I was to hop on this and hit recall, check this out. This will just pick up and bring me back to the spot. Now you can even do this in the opposite kind of way. When you're walking away from something, you're pushing a button. Just combine that concept. Think about that, how to use those two together and that'll make you figure out new ways of even completing shrines. I don't wanna spoil any of those methods so you can figure those out on your own, but I just wanted to put that in your brain. When you invade enemy Bokoblin camps and you see any cages nearby, you can actually put the boss Bokoblin inside of a cage. And on top of that, you can throw an electric item on it. So that it could be electrocuted. A really easy, powerful weapon to get early game that you can find is basically the Bokoblin skeleton arms that you can find at night. Kill two of them and then fuse them both together to get a plus 40 attack weapon. Now these things last for a little bit of time. They do break and don't last forever, but they are easy to make, especially because these Bokoblins keep coming out at night. So you could stack up with them and fight some enemies at night, or you could just clear up enemy camps easy in the early game with this Bokoblin arm. Amiibos give some pretty awesome items in the game. What you want to do is hit the plus button and go to options from your system menu. Make sure that Amiibos are enabled. They start off the game by having them disabled, so you're going to want to click on it and turn it on. Once you're at a point in the game where it allows you to scan Amiibos, you should get this icon right over here. By placing there, you're going to look at the floor, place your Amiibo on your control, and go ahead and scan it. Now the interesting part is when you try to scan the same amiibo again, it's going to tell you that you can't use the amiibo again today. So what you want to do if you want to farm your amiibos non-stop over and over to get items, what you want to do is save your game, then completely close out your game, go to system settings, down to system, date and time, and go to the next date. After you do that, open up your game, and you should be able to scan the exact same amiibos again. And just like that, you could scan your amiibo again. If you don't have every amiibo, don't worry. The special gear from them also exists in secret quests and spots in the game. The only big bonus that amiibo users get are paragliders. This red stuff that you see by all the chasms or by the castle or when you go to the underground is known as gloom. When you step on Gloom, it can eat away your extra bonus hearts. And the longer you stay on here, you can see it going through all your hearts. So please be very careful when you are walking on this. If you walk fast enough off of it, 
you won't lose a heart when you initially step on it. it but you have to be really quick before the heart goes but if you're on it for too long you can see the hearts just go away now, when you're in the overworld, they do recover and the gloom effect goes away. But if you are in the depths, these do not recover until you get to a light route. So you can see at the top left of my screen, they are still damaged when you drop down here. So not looking good. In order to fix gloom, you're going to use a sundelion recipe. Pretty much the simple one is going to be one sundelion plus a meat. That's going to give you two hearts recovered and three gloom hearts fixed. And then if you look at my hearts and I do eat this food, you'll see that we do actually recover some hearts here. So make those foods if you are in a dangerous situation in the depths. You can find sundelions in the sky islands above. When you dive into a chasm, always look for a light route in the surrounding area. Make sure to dive into every single chasm on the map when you come across it to help unlock the map of the depths because it is absolutely huge. In the depths, make sure to break any rocks you see as they contain zonite. This will be used for creations via auto build. Zonite can be traded for zonite charges, which are used on various zonite dispensers that look like gumball machines throughout all of Hyrule that give you parts that you can use to build whatever you want. In my opinion, you should not be trading Zonite for Zonite charges because you should actually be farming them from constructs in the sky. Trading Zonite for crystallized charges is a much better because it can be used to upgrade your battery that you have when activating Zonite parts. The battery is on the character over here. This vendor appears at Lookout Landing as well as in the Sky Island at Nachoya Shrine indicated by this battery symbol on the map. When you're down in the depths, make sure to also collect any of these blue flames that you see. Very important because you'll be using these blue flames to purchase some OP armor later on that can give you gloom resistance and even some previous amiibo items that you scanned in the game. Collecting pose, you can start the quest for it by talking to this rock actually at Lookout Landing. The rock will talk to you and say, I am the one who returns Poe's to the afterlife where they belong. Then give it a Poe. Then he'll give you a dark clump. And then you'll be able to purchase things from its own shop with your Poe's. The more of these you find in the underground statue, the more things that unlock on its menu. He mentions his brethren who are underground. And the more of them you find, the more options that open up in that shop. When you're in the depths, make sure to find these flowers and collect them. Muddle buds are very good on bows and arrows. When you approach a group of enemies, take out your arrow, aim at them, and select the muddle bud. This is going to confuse them, but aim for the strongest monster in the group first. And then they'll all just start fighting each other and watch it go into chaos. So this is a white one, which is a very strong, and he's just going to go for all the other ones, clearing out all the other enemies for you. Dang, he landed a crit on him. He mad though. And the cool part is even when you're close to the enemy, they won't attack you when you hit them with a muddle bud. They will be focusing on the other enemies being absolutely confused. So definitely use this in a very dangerous situation. At every single stable you find in the game, you'll find this character with a big backpack. Go ahead and talk to him. This is Beetle and Beetle sells you tons of arrows that you can buy. And the cool part is Beetle is in every single stable you come across. So if you're running low on arrows, you want to buy some, you can buy it off of him, buy some other things as well. And Beetle also buys your items. So if you need to quickly sell something and you're on the road, you can also sell your items over to Beetle here. Beetle will probably also spend a little bit of extra money if you get a Beetle. That's why his name is Beetle. So yeah, just, just letting you know about Beetle. Whenever you're walking around the world, you'll see these stones fall down from the sky. It almost feels like these stones fall as you're heading to an objective. What you want to do is hop onto the stone, use the recall ability, and you'll watch it go right back to the sky. And if you're heading towards a direction that requires a lot of movement, well, you can use the height of that rock rising to your advantage and continue forward to get an objective. I used my to hop inside of a tower to reveal the map. This one is actually game changing. If you're by a cooking pot or have a cooking pot ready to go and you're ready to make some food, open up your plus menu and look at some of your materials, right? If you click on one of your foods, you can select select for recipe and then click on the exact recipe that you want. So for example, steam meat, boom, you have all of the food right there and you don't have to individually select it to cook the food. It just saves so much more time than individually selecting it over and over again, which Breath of the Wild 
It's all we did, but now you can just select the recipe. Also, be aware recipes will only show up for ingredients that you have used in a dish. There are a lot of strange markings on the ground called geoglyphs. In order to start the geoglyph quest line, you have to go over to the new Serene Stable by Sinakawak Shrine. This is going to be by Hyrule Ridge, basically to the west of Lookout Landing. So directly west over here. And Impa is actually going to be here and you go ahead to talk to her and begin that quest line. And then you'll uncover all the various stories and information about these geoglyphs in the locations. Korok seeds are located everywhere in Hyrule and in the Sky Islands. Make sure to do these. There are 100 carry a Korok quest to his friends, which rewards you with two Korok seeds and 800 normal Korok quests that are hidden throughout the game. That's a total of 1,000 Korok seeds in the game. When you get some Korok seeds, you can find somebody over here. This is Hestu. Hestu is someone who is able to do a few upgrades with you. This is the first location that you'll be able to find Hestu in. And if I open up my map and show you, you can see that I am located right over here. And you can see from this position that that is a stable, which is New Serene Stable, right over here, right down here. So all you gotta do is just follow that road up New Serene and come up this hill. And you can look at my map at the exact coordinates to see where exactly this is. So you're going to do a quest for him. After you do the little side mission for Hestu, you're going to have an interaction with him. Hestu mentions that he needs one Korok seed in order to expand your inventory. After that, Hestu will do a dance. Your inventory will expand on the one that you selected. And there you go. You can pick up another weapon. So after two expansions of whatever you choose, Hestu will then head east. After this, you're going to want to teleport all the way back to Lookout Landing. As soon as you arrive in Lookout Landing, you can head straight and you'll find Hestu right over here. You can increase your inventory here again. And after a couple more expansions, Hestu will then leave this area and probably head to the Korok Forest. But that's going to be a whole nother video. Whenever you come across wooden barrels or crates, make sure to break them for arrows. You're going to be using a ton of arrows in this game. So please do that to make your life a lot easier. When you're in Lookout Landing, head over to the underground shelter. If it's not open up, you just got to talk to this guy and it'll slide open. When you drop down here in the underground shelter, you got to look for the goddess statue. It is right in front of your face. You can go and talk to this and redeem any single shrines that you may have gotten lights of blessings from. So if you finish four shrines, you get four lights of blessings. That means you can get one entire new heart or one fifth of a new stamina bar. I suggest you go for stamina bars because stamina is going to be really important for traveling early on in the game. Game. Star fragments are back in this game and you can catch them mid-air while you're falling down. Star fragments are very useful for some recipes and also for upgrading your special armor. If you ever come across someone in trouble fighting an enemy or monster in Hyrule, make sure to go ahead and help them and fight the enemy. After you defeat the enemy, go ahead and talk to the person and they might just reveal a secret about a certain treasure spot or a clue that'll help you find something really spicy in the game. Enjoying these tips? Just hit that like button real quick. That, that, that That's how you tip me with likes. Thanks. In the rain, because it's really loud, you can sneak up on enemies and perform a sneak strike on them. The best time to cook will be during a blood moon. When you notice the weird sounds happening in the background, make sure you're paying attention to the moon and make sure to pay attention to the time. So from 1130 up until the blood moon starts, when you cook, you'll be able to have elixirs that have longer time and the buffs will last longer on the meals that you cook, as well as the bonuses from the food. Once it turns 1150, you want to go ahead and head to a shrine as fast as possible. Once you're at a shrine, just walk in and then walk out until the blood moon is gone. And when you go back outside, it'll be after 12, the blood moon completely skipped and it'll come back the next night. And you can rinse and repeat and cook again and do this over and over again until you want to trigger the blood moon. Right before a blood moon, if you kill a bunch of enemies and then the blood moon triggers, all the enemies will spawn back. As you can see, I took out a white boss bow goblin and then all of a sudden after the blood moon, the white boss bow goblin was there again in all his minions. Weapons also respawn in the game when this happens. If you are ever exploring your world and you come across a cherry blossom tree, make sure to always, always, always go to it. And when you are in front of that tree, you want to walk up to the front of it where you're going to find a little altar that you can offer something up to. What you're going to want to do is open up your inventory, select an apple, hold that apple. It doesn't matter if it's a golden apple or a regular apple, place it down on that. 
and as soon as you place it, a cutscene will trigger. Once this appears on your map and the cutscene happens, you're going to see all these glowing spots be revealed from these secret locations. And what these glowing spots indicate is these are where caves are located on the map. You'll be shocked to find out how many caves are just hidden away in just places you would have never expected. So make sure to do this everywhere you go. Whenever you see a bloopy, make sure to follow the direction it's going in because it's going to lead you to a cave. When you find a cave, it'll show up on your minimap with a little symbol of a cave. When you go inside of the cave and find the glowing frog and shoot it or kill it, however you want to do, it'll drop a gem. And when you get that gem and go back to your map, it'll show that the cave is completed. So make sure to be looking to not confuse finished caves with unfinished caves by finishing up the frogs. By the way, you want to collect all of these gems in every single cave you can find because these will be redeemed for some special clothing items later on in the game from a special merchant. If you find yourself in a position where you can't break any rocks properly with the weapons you have, just look for a rock on a cave floor that you can fuse your weapons with. Once you fuse your weapons with this rock, you should be able to easily break the items. You can also use spiked iron balls attached to a weapon to break rocks, or you can even use cobble crushers as well to break rocks. Whenever you go into a cave and you find these ore deposits, make sure you break them so that you can get rare items like rubies, sapphires, diamonds, topaz, opals, and the other common drops. You can also have a better chance if they are gold and sparkly to get the way better items from this. You can use these as elemental arrows or you can just sell them for a lot of money. Whenever you're walking around the world of Hyrule or go into caves and you see this monster hanging from a ceiling or on the side of a wall, make sure to take it out because that monster will always drop a chest and there could be some goodies in that chest. Look at that, I got a nice night shield in this one. One of the most powerful arrow attachments in the game are Gibdo Bones. In order to farm these, you have to head over to the desert. Now, please do not finish the desert storyline at all or the desert temple or the lightning temple that is in the desert because that'll end all the Gibdos that are roaming around in the overworld. If you do decide to start the lightning quest, there's going to be a lot of story instances where Gibdos are going to be unlimited. You'll be getting unlimited arrows and unlimited bows to fight a bunch of them. So you can use this opportunity to farm them and I really suggest farm the heck out of it since it has an attack power of 40. A cool trick to create a bunch of elemental arrows basically interchanging them is to first farm a bunch of blue chews in the Hyrule field area. Blue chews are almost like the base element that you're going to be using to transform into other ones and they're the most common ones we'll find in the beginning of the game. Collect a lot of them. When you need specific elements of different types you'll find fire chews in the volcano area, you'll find electric chews in the desert area, and you'll find the ice chews in these snow areas. Now the cool thing about chews is that when you throw down all the blue chews here, you can throw electric at it and they will all turn into electric ones. You can pick them up, attach them to your arrows, and now you have even more electric arrows. The same works when you throw down ice and you throw down fire onto those chews as well. You can also interchange between ice chews and electric chews and other chews. So you can switch to one entire element until you don't need any more if you use this method. If you ever find yourself out in the wild and you need to do something in order to speed up the time of day or change it or just rest in general because you just want it to be nighttime and maybe you want to farm something at night, go ahead and just chop a tree. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take a piece of wood. You're going to take a piece of flint that you can get from a cave or those rocks, throw that on the ground, and then you're going to strike it with something metallic. That's then going to start a fireplace. And then you can go to the fireplace, sit down by it and wait until whatever time you want. And that's how you use a fireplace. While you're also exploring the game, make sure to not ignore wells. You can actually go down these wells and find some secrets that are possibly there. Always, always jump down wells when you see them. When you visit any stable in Hyrule, you'll be able to get a point just for visiting them for the first time. You can also get points for sleeping at the stables and registering horses. As you get more points, you can read a book that is located on the side of the stable that's called the Pony Points Ledger, and you can receive your reward. These rewards will help you customize your horse with various things like saddles, and wagons and other things. You should probably do it because this also is something you might need for your great fairy quest. The great fairies in this game refuse to come out unless they hear music. In order to get the quest line started for them, you must start the Lucky Clover Gazette quest by Rito Village. 
and then proceed over to Woodland Stable where you will find musicians. That's when you'll start to unlock the fairies who will be very, very useful for upgrading your armor. If you ever come across fairies like this, make sure that you sneak up on them and grab them. They're very, very, very useful. Take your time. There's no rush. Let them come down to you. And then when they're close enough, there you go. Then you grab them. That way, if for some reason you ever fall or take damage, you can get your hearts back. So watch what happens when I get hit. Here we go. Whack. Boom. And then the fairy is going to bring me back to life. That's why you should get the fairy. OK, I'm out of here. <laughs> Fusing a ruby with a weapon allows you to stay nice and warm in the game. So it'll raise Link's body temperature. So if your character is ever absolutely freezing, all you really got to do is put on some archaic warm greaves and you can grab a weapon, grab yourself a ruby, use that with your cobble crusher. So, uh, so archaic greaves plus a warm weapon will keep you toasty in the coldest areas of the game while just a weapon on its own or archaic greaves on its own will keep you warm in the like desert areas. Fusing a sapphire on a weapon allows Link to not take any damage in hot weather and actually cools him down. If you fuse an opal to a weapon, you'll be able to get really awesome water properties like being able to throw water across this entire lava chasm and cross it. Fusing a topaz to your weapon will give you electric properties, allows you to shoot some beams out. And when you use electric properties on enemies, they disarm them completely so they won't have any weapons at all. This is the location of Hatino Village on your map. It is all the way on the east side of the map underneath Mount Lanero. And the reason why as an early game player, you probably want to come over here is because there is a die shop here. And in that die shop, there are tons and tons of dies that you could put on your outfits, as well as being able to change your paragliders that you get in the game. That way your link doesn't have to look like anyone else's link and can be completely different. So go ahead and go on customizing. Another big tip is that you should probably click on this video over here because you're probably going to learn something just like you did from this video.